themes, two talks, first by Gregory Sadler on what kind of moral theory it is Anselm Anselm Hall, second by Irfan Kawaja, 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 on physical appearance and moral character. How about we begin with Gregory Sadler from Marist College, so Gregory, if you come forward, and his title again is What Kind of Moral Theory Does St. Anselm Hold? And um, we have, what, 45 minutes for each paper, so you can give a couple of questions and then we go on to the ear phone. So uh, we're going to make some jibes back and forth about Benedictines and Franciscans. Right. Today is actually the feast of, of St. Anselm, so I'm very happy to be giving the paper on his, on his feast day. Uh, Anselm of Canterbury, famous to philosophy for his so-called ontological argument, is less well known for his moral theory. Equally worthy of attention, revealing itself to attentive study, is surprisingly rich and original. What I intend this paper to do is to set up some main lines of Anselm's moral theory, motivated by providing an answer to the question, what kind of moral theory does Anselm hold? Can we effectively locate it under a rubric typically discussed in contemporary classes and literature, like utilitarianism, deontology, virtue ethics, and the like? Or does it eclectically fuse together elements or aspects of such moral theories? Or is it perhaps sui generis defying any such categorization, perhaps challenging the adequacy of such classificatory schemes? Two obstacles block the path to providing answers to these questions. One of these is the unsystematic nature of Anselm's moral thought as preserved in writing, which he never consolidated into a treatise resembling Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics or Kant's Groundwork. So one must weave together threads running through his treatises, the letters, the Vita, the Dicta Anselmi, even his prayers and meditations in order to generate a full view of his moral theory. There is, however, one central point around which the many aspects of his moral theory constellate. One concept and experience that is rectitude or rightness of will kept for its own sake, which as Dom Boucher observed, appears alongside id quo maius cogitari non potest, is one of St. Anselm's most central thoughts. You see this as we go through his works uh, reoccurring. But this formula requires considerable unpacking and specification, which one needs to do following lines Anselm himself set out again, in multiple and unpredictable locations. So the first part, categories of the good. One central aspect to any moral theory involves the basic good or goods the theory recognizes and values. What does it hold to be good? How does it order or arrange goods in relation to each other? What good, if any, does it ascribe priority to as the most valuable, as fundamental, even as the basis of other goodnesses? Anselm's works contain numerous recognitions of, references to, and distinctions between a surprisingly broad and rich variety of goods. Can we reduce these to some sort of general classification? In the Monologion, he says to himself, you are accustomed to consider nothing good except on account of some usefulness or on account of some intrinsic goodness, giving health and what conduces to health as examples of the former, and beauty and what contributes to beauty of the latter. All goods in this view are either useful goods, that is valuable and typically willed for the sake of something else, or intrinsic, honestum, goods, valuable and willed for their own sakes or on their own accounts. The monologian treatment also introduces several other important Anselmian doctrines, including the notion of distinctively different degrees as opposed to mere quantities of goodness or greatness, reflected not only in subjective evaluations, but objectively in the very being of things. He argues for an ontological dependency of goods on other goods, ultimately on the divine goodness, which later he tells us is a dynamic unity of whatever it is better to be than not to be, including supreme wisdom, truth, goodness, beauty, greatness, and justice, among the other divine attributes. Just as importantly, he accords to reason not only a capacity to discern between and order goods and values, but also a normative requirement to employ this capacity rightly, he says. For a rational nature, being rational is nothing other than being able to distinguish the just from the non-just, the true from the non-true, the good from the non-good, and the more good from the less good. Ultimately, this apprehension of values assumes not only cognitive or inferential, but also affective and connotative forms. Already in Anselm's earliest work, we glimpse the human being is called to distinguish and act upon their distinctions between different kinds and degrees of goodness understanding and framing these perhaps by reference to a divine source and exemplar of goodness. 
So what additional light or clarity do his subsequent works bring? Skipping over De Veritate for the moment, in De Libertate, the distinction between goods willed for the sake of other things and goods willed for their own sakes gets revisited, framed in terms of whether one can will something unwillingly in some respects, that is, whether one can have a will divided against itself and over several objects. Anselm uses health as an example of a good willed for its own sake, with drinking absinthe, which we probably wouldn't associate with health these days, but they did back then, as something willed for the sake of health, indicating that something like health might be regarded in certain situations or by some persons as an intrinsic good, by others as merely useful or instrumental. Considering a forced choice between willing the end of keeping rectitude of will or willing to preserve one's life or safety, Anselm introduces another important consideration, the unavoidable necessity to choose between different goods, to order them to prefer and to prioritize a theme he expands in the De Casu Deaboli. Anselm introduces further refinements bearing on goods and the will in that work, most notably by distinguishing between two fundamental and determinative orientations of the human or any other rational beings, well, angels, fallen angels, any other conceivable rational beings, the will to happiness and the will to justice. In later works, Anselm con uh, consistently refers to these as inclinations or dispositions of the will, affecciones, distinguishable from the will as instrument as well as the particular willings as use of that instrument, which are conditioned by these wills as inclinations. The will to justice can be lacking or present in a person, but the will to happiness is always present and active, although not always specifically configured in the same way. The will to happiness, he says, is a natural will for avoiding the detrimental and for having the beneficial. This involves willing those things and conditions which one considers in some way to be beneficial to oneself, willing happiness and to be happy, and whatever is regarded as conducive or necessary to realizing such desires. A thing may be beneficial in different ways. One thing is beneficial, he says, through its use or when used, another through what it brings about, still another through both. The category of the beneficial thus almost entirely encompasses the previous distinction between useful goods, valued for the sake of other goods, and intrinsic goods valued for their own sakes. I add that qualifier almost, because although the category of the beneficial includes the entirety of the useful, a portion of intrinsic goods fall within another distinct category, the good of justice. So this is the second part. For Anselm, justice is a different, higher, more valuable kind of good than the others which we've explored thus far. Justice in the full and primary sense of the term, rightness or moral goodness, the justice which, as he says, should be praised and whose opposite should be condemned, the justice which is, quote, that very good through which people are good and on account of which the will is said to be good or just, exists or does not, is present or absent, within the will of a rational being. Correspondingly, he says, injustice is that very evil which we say is nothing other than privation of the good, or as he adds, the absence of a justice that has been abandoned. Since other than, in, that other than justice or injustice, nothing is called just or unjust except for the will, or on account of the just or unjust will, the justice or injustice, the specifically moral goodness or badness of other things, including, these are examples he uses, actions, hearts, persons, states of affairs, even the carnal appetites, resides not in them, but it derives from the will's relation to them. Justice in Anselm's thought is the specific modality of goodness a rational will can possess, a goodness qualitatively greater than the goodness of beneficial goods, and thus to be preferred to, valued more highly than merely beneficial goods, or even happiness. In fact, a rational being ought to have justice in its will, and insofar as it lacks justice, it is to that degree, or in that way, unjust, not as it should be, not as it was meant to be. This is a uh, language that Anselm uses constantly, this notion of Debere. Uh, the rational being received a free faculty of will precisely for the purpose, he says, of willing what one should with it, that is, justice and justly. But then, what is justice? Adequately answering this from an Anselmian perspective, requires a step-by-step -step process of setting out formulations which integrate with each other. One first step is to say that justice is doing or willing what one ought to. That is, willing or acting in, in accordance with some sort of identifiable rule or standard applying to the situation. Or to use the alternative formulation Anselm employs, 
that employs, what is fitting? Setting aside for the moment the issue of precisely how one determines what one ought to do or will, one can ask, as Anselm has his student do in the De Veritate, is this all there is to justice? Following a set of rules or commands, willing to do the right thing in the situation? And the answer is no, for Anselm. In order to be just, one must not only will the right thing, but also will it because of one should, or more simply expressed, because one should. The reason why one wills something matters. If one were to will what is right solely because of the apprehension, desire, and pursuit of produ production of the beneficial, like a dog, for instance, he uses this example, loving its puppies through instinct, there is no justice in the willing or action, although there is to be sure goodness. If one wills and does what is right out of vain glory, or simply to avoid punishment, again, at least in De Veritate, in the person's will, there is thereby no actual justice. One must will the right thing as the right thing because it is the right thing, not because of beneficial goods or happiness one also necessarily desires and wills. Anselm seems as intransigent and uncompromising as Kant on this point. When one wills justly, one wills, he says, rectitude of will kept for its own sake, which is in fact his definition of justice. Whatever, whatever other objects the will may have or desire, it must also intend this one, or justice is lacking in the person who is willing. Often there exist compatibilities between these motivations of happiness or beneficial goods and the motivation of justice. In fact, in a well-ordered person, he says, the will to justice, quote, tempers the, the will to happiness, restraining the will's excesses. But there will also be incompatibilities, occasions where one must choose according priority either to happiness or benefit, or to justice, one at the expense of the other. In fact, the object of the will to justice, as Anselm tells us at multiple points, by its nature involves an interesting and sometimes even puzzling self-referentiality. He uh, says, by contrast to, to the will, the will which is towards willing the beneficial, which is not the same thing that it wills, the will which is towards willing rectitude is rectitude. For nobody wills rectitude without having rectitude nor can someone will it, unless by rectitude. Bringing God into the picture adds another dimension to Anselm's conception of justice. This enrichment or complication of his moral theory, depending on how you look at it, is inevitable for two main reasons. First, as noted earlier, Anselm's ontology, including even the being of values, is decidedly theocentric. God does not only act justly, know what justice comprises, will justice, or possess justice to his highest degree, God is justice itself, all other instances of justice in some way participating in the divine justice. So presumably any justice in the human being or will is going to involve some eventual reference to God. Second, Anselm does in fact explicitly specify justice in relation to God. At so many points in his works that I'm only going to provide a few representative passages. He says, keeping rectitude of will for the sake of that very rectitude is for each person to will what God wills that person to will, which is rather you know, convoluted when you first hear it. Uh, there's a lot of wills in that sentence. Every rational will of the creature, he says, should be subject to the will of God. That one's a bit more straightforward. Every rational creature owes that obedience to God. Rectitude of will is present in someone when that person wills what God wills them to will. Again, that, the repetition of that. And it's not only that, he also has to uh, he expresses this in terms of affections or, or um, our emotions. Those who fill their hearts with love of God and neighbor will will nothing but what God wills or another person wills as long as this is not contrary to God. So these are all ways of expressing the determinate content of justice for him. And they're all, you know, as we, we can see, quite theocentric. So the third part. If one was to select a commonly referenced moral theory with which to associate Anselm's position at this point, it would not be surprising if it were either deontological or divine command ethics. Many characteristic Anselmian assertions sound like, sound like Kantianism of Aunt Lilith. The absolute contrast between other goods, the useful, the beneficial, those we seek through an, an ineradicable will to happiness, and the good of justice, seems much like Kant's stress on duty's absolute priority over any objects of our desires and inclinations. The heterogeneous diversity of goods desired for and as components of a state of happiness that Anselm acknowledges 
calls to mind Kant's own suspicions about whether happiness can even be adequately understood, let alone enjoyed, precisely because it would comprise complete satisfaction of a being's inclinations and desires. Identification of distinctly moral goodness as justice in, Anselm, in Anselm's case resembles Kant's own framing as willing not only in conformity to duty, but from duty. The focus on the will and its motives, on willing justice for its own sake, with the object of maintaining justice within the will, also sounds like Kantianism in medieval garb. So could Anselm be a Kantian? There are good reasons to answer no. Among them the fact that justice and one's own happiness do remain integrally interconnected for Anselm, in, in contrast to Kant who stresses the dissociation between happiness and duty. Explaining precisely how this, this takes place goes beyond the scope of this paper, but it can be said that the unavoidably theological dimension of Anselm's theory plays a part. In fact, this is another point about this, this would render it hopelessly heteronymous to Kant in multiple ways. Not only does Anselm say explicitly that rectitude of will consists in obedience to the divine will, which would be bad enough from Kant's perspective, he also maintains that once justice has been abandoned by the will of a rational being, it can only be restored by God's grace. Such considerations raise the possibility that Anselm's moral theory is best understood as an example of divine command ethics. There are certain ambiguities about precisely what such a moral theory involves, but one generally agreed upon characterization is that the theory renders morality ultimately dependent on God, the divine will, or that will is promulgated in command so that practically speaking, divine revelation becomes the source for moral standards and right action involves and is measured by obedience to or conformity with such revealed commands. If all that is meant by this is that God is the ultimate origin of goodness or justice, as we've already seen, this is true of Anselm's theory. But divine command moral theory is typically interpreted as implying that God can, or even does, command actions which might seem to contradict morality, but which by virtue of being commanded by God thereby become morally right, even obligatory. Other typical commitments assert God or divine revelation to be the exclusive source of moral standards, goodness or rightness, or that a human being cannot be moral without knowing God's revealed commands, recognizing and following them solely because they are God's commands, not because God happens or necessarily commands what in fact is good, right, and moral. If we understand divine command theory along these lines, divine command theory is explicitly rejected by Anselm uh, in, in multiple places. So the fourth part, does Anselm hold a natural law theory? What other moral theory or theories might Anselms be more closely aligned with? Perhaps in looking uh, at a few passages where Anselm actually carries out moral reasoning, or where he mentions sources for moral reasoning and evaluation, more suitable candidates will suggest themselves. Not surprisingly, Anselm does refer to scripture as a guide for morality in two ways. At times, meditation upon the meaning of passages leads him into drawing out implications <coughs> for the nature and condition of the human being, human relations, and interactions with the divine, and particularly about moral matters. At other times, he cites appropriate passages to provide a basis, an example, just to, or just to inform a moral claim or line of argument that he, that he makes. Interestingly, Anselm places equal weight on authoritative interpreters of scripture in the Christian life, admonishing a fellow bishop, for instance, by saying, I've quoted a few of the many authorities. If it's a sin to speak against the Lord and against so many holy fathers who truly understand the sayings of the Lord, what is it then to act against authority? Yet, Anselm is no fundamentalist or ecclesial authoritarian. What qualifies such authorities is that they've demonstrated themselves to have developed genuine wisdom, a state which requires some moral as well as intellectual progress. In fact, faith and reason, the divine order and the natural human intellect, are not radically opposed to each other for Anselm. Anselm writes of scripture as, quote, containing the authority for every truth reason infers, since it either clearly affirms them or does not in any way deny them. He asserts that the justice one, one ought to cultivate can be called the law of God, since it's from God, but also the law of the mind, since it's understood by the mind, just as the old law is called the law of God, since it's from God, and the law of Moses, since it was provided through Moses. Anselm himself rarely uses the term natural law, but it would be no stretch to say that his moral theory bears strong affinities with a natural law moral theory like that of Thomas Aquinas. For Anselm, all created being is permeated by the orders of divine providence, 
But we human beings participate in this in ways radically transcending those of non-rational beings through our uses of reason and through our willing, both of which permit us to go astray as, as well as rightly. So we're called in his view to employ reason to more and more fully discern and willingly cooperate with an ordering, a law, a, commonly, a complexly structured normativity which has its source in the divine but shares its intelligibility with the human being seeking to be as it ought to be or as it was made to be. Again, the created human being, he tells us, is rational so that it might discern between the just and the unjust, between the good and the evil, and between the more good and the less good. Otherwise, it would have been made rational in vain. By a similar reasoning, he says, it's proven that it received the power of discernment, so it would hate and avoid evil, and it would love and prefer the good, even more greatly love and prefer the greater good. Uh, so reason is, is a, a source for our, our uh, uh, grasp of, of the, this, this uh, ordering built into things. One consequence of this bears directly on the human relationship with the divine through justice and ordering of goods. He says, it's certain that the rational nature was made for this, that it should love and prefer the supreme good above everything else, and not for the sake of something else, but for its own sake. And this bears intellectual implications as well. The rational creature ought to apply all of its capacity and will to remembering, understanding, loving the supreme good, for which end he knows himself to possess his very being. Both in general and in determinate situations, the human being must employ reason in one way or another to discern what is good and bad what ought to be done and what ought to be avoided, not only in weighing and ordering various goods, but also working out their concrete arrangements and implications, informing the will which ultimately chooses. To do this rightly is not only to strive towards one, one's final end, but also to realize what a human being was made to be and ought to be in action, in willing and thinking, in desires, affections, emotions, even in relationships. In fact, full rationality is not simply a given any more than is right volition and the functioning of both faculties in form and influence each other's development or degeneration in Anselm's moral theory. Everything said so far sounds compatible enough with Thomas' natural law theory, but as pointed out, Anselm rarely uses that term and certainly does not provide us with any systematically derived set of precepts of the natural law. So depending on how one wants to define that sort of theory, Anselm may or may not fit. The last part. The most promising prospect for assigning Anselm's moral theory is actually virtue ethics, not least because Anselm himself speaks in terms of virtue and vice so often. Eadmer, his biographer, tells us that Anselm engaged in sustained and systematic study in which he, quote, uncovered the origins and, so to speak, the very seeds and roots and process of growth of all virtues and vices, and made it clearer than light how the former could be attained and the latter avoided or subdued. Now, we kind of wish Anselm would have actually written this down, but most of what he did was oral. One might raise a problematic question, though, for simply talking about virtues does not necessarily entail a commitment to virtue ethics. It would seem that at least two other things are needed. A thinker would have to articulate a robust conception of virtues and vices as developed dispositions, reflective of character and choice, and would also have to make them central to, rather than derivative in, moral life, development, and evaluation. So does Anselm do this? Well, he maintains that virtues are good mores, qualities of the soul which were unstable, now brought to the condition of habit, says they exist in the soul as stable. The virtues are also products of the human use of the will. Right choices and commitments are both productive of and products of the virtues. They are also in accordance with the virtues conforming to their patterns and dictates. When the person's will is properly aligned, the soul and its powers are open to doing what God commands, what justice demands, what rightly Use reason reveals, Anselm says. He says, for the soul is open to the inclination of the virtues and to willing what should be preferred. Memory to the remembering of what ought to be remembered, thought to thinking what ought to be thought upon, understanding to distinguishing what, what should be willed or remembered or thought. And the mind is raised up to charity, is disposed to humility, is strengthened towards patience, and is open to, he says, the other virtues that, it should, that should be generated. Now, Anselm tells us in what we do have of, of his writings much more about the monastic mode of life than others, but there's no reason to think that his consistent stress on the need to inculcate virtues and root out vices in that mode is not reflective of a broader attitude applying to all human beings. In a beautiful analogy, he even makes virtues central in the right use of reason, 
He says, just as the human body cannot subsist without frequent provision of food to it, so the soul cannot live by reason without frequent engagement with the virtues. So the virtues can be thought of as determinate ways in which the will to justice assumes a stable form in the human will, in the soul, in the human being, in the pattern of his or her life, actions, and relationships. The will to justice itself, it should be noted, can be stronger or weaker in a person and must develop through willing and actions so that it properly structures and eventually pervades the person's will to happiness. This entire, you know, complex of desires that we, we naturally have. Directing the person towards enjoyment of his or her true ends. One must also develop the capacity for perseverance within the will, for resisting the temptation to choose goods incompatible with justice, a kind of fortitude consisting in willing perseveringly, cleaving constantly or consistently to rectitude of will kept for its own sake. In the end, then, Anselm's moral theory is most adequately understood as a virtue ethics in which justice, humility, perseverance, and charity are arguably, and in different ways, the most architectonic virtues. I'll close with a passage from one of Anselm's letters, writing as their abbot to his fellow monks of, of Beck. He says, uh, this is fairly typical of him, my joy in this world is your virtuous life. I pray, I beseech you, that absent or present you may gladden my heart by living virtuously and satisfy my longing and joy by your goodness. Thanks. Thank you. Well, nicely pitched, just about um, half an hour. In fact, just under half an hour. So, ah, good. Uh, nice and timed presentation. All right, we now have about 15 minutes uh, for um, questions, comments. Yeah, uh, this is a sort of meta question about the project as a whole. Um, it seems to me that uh, the conclusion, in a way, of your attempts to characterize Anselm is that he doesn't actually fit any of the any of the, the categories that contemporary theorists might want to put him in. Is that right, or am I? Well, I, th I think that he does fit virtue ethics. Okay, but, but virtue ethics. Um, I mean, one integral part of that that, that tradition is. Who's, who's virtue ethics? Right. Are we looking at uh, Eric, you know, highly Aristotelian virtue ethics? Or are we looking at Thomistic virtue ethics? Um, where you know, it's going to be connected with natural law. Yeah, I don't think he fits, he certainly doesn't fit Kant's version of deontology, which you know, we seem to view as the uh, exemplar. Um, he doesn't fit the divine command theory. Clearly, um, says, says no on that. Um, natural law is kind of a tough fit, although there's a lot of good alignments. Ethics of care is actually an attractive one because Anselm focuses so much on the emotions, on relationships, and, and how those ought to be structured, especially on, on love and, and caring. Um, but the academic category of it, it he, he wouldn't fit, I think, very well. But virtue ethics, he does. Um, but virtue ethics, you think of like McIntyre's version of virtue ethics where virtue ethics cannot just be some, some category by itself to the exclusion of these other, other theories. It has to incorporate what's best in them. Mm -hmm. Going back to Aristotle again, mm -hmm. Anselm is doing something like that. So the elements of other theories, like, like the focus, the, you know, very strong focus on the will and rectitude of the will kept for its own sake, which looks like the ontology, would, would have to be incorporated into virtue ethics in order to, to make it work well. Yeah, the reason I'm asking the question is I was considering the possibility that maybe Anselm's theory is just sui generis, in which case trying to pigeonhole him a certain way might might detract from the distinctiveness of the view. Some of the people who've written on Anselm's moral theory, and there's not an awful lot out there, um, seem to to interpret him like that, but. What I want to what I want to do is to, to sort of bring him into the fold of, of virtue ethics and say that he is uh, you know one of the things that we often forget in part because when we look at the medievals those of us that are interested in it tend I think to focus much more on scholastic philosophy and theology than, than monastic uh, philosophy and theology um, guys like Anselm get left out of the picture although they were incredibly influential uh, throughout the throughout the even on the, the scholastic 
Um, so I, I want to bring Anselm back into the fold, you might say. And the, the larger project is I'm writing a book on Anselm's poem theory. Um, and so you're getting almost, you might say, just talking points in, in this one. Not, not particularly well supported, maybe. So. Actually, I can pick up on this. I just put on the board a um, distinction which you're doubt new, but um, you're talking about the end of an action. Mm -hmm. There are three ways of talking about the end, and just before the talk, you went to get a cup of coffee. Well, what you wanted, quad, okay, was the coffee. Yeah. For, for what you wanted was yourself. And how you wanted it was in, in drinking. And hot. Well, the yes. drinking is, is the way, well, I, hot, okay. coffee, I, I, hot, hot, hot coffee would be here. Yeah. Um, so, what do you want? I want a cup, cup of coffee, but I want it for me to drink. Yeah. Right? Um, typically, in when people criticize virtue theory, especially in the case of Aristotle and, and Aquinas, and the notion of happiness being, they say, well, this is too selfish, too self-focused. This yeah. is a Kantian point. And they're accusing them of distinguishing the quad and the kui, right? That, you, you pursue the good, which good? The good that's good for me, that's my happiness. Yeah. So the, the, the what you're desiring is subordinated to me as being what it is for the sake of. All right? Now, you rightly pointed out, I think, that for Hansel, that too is an error. If you, if well, you desire it yeah. for me, that's the amor, the love of concupiscence. Well, actually, he says there's good and bad concupiscence. And, but, and, but nevertheless, it's yeah. still desiring it for me. Anselm is, is fine with goods for me. With him, it's a question of the ordering of goods. Right. Um, and, and even with regular virtue ethics. You know, so people have been debating, is Aristotle an egoist? And I think exactly. that, that's not a useful uh, way to frame it, because in order to enjoy happiness in a full sense, you have to be sharing it with other people. So you can't be just a uh, you know, But that would be enough for, for surely for I mean, you sharing can... goodness with other people? That's what heaven is for him. Yeah, but, but surely, as you mentioned, right, the, yeah. the, the, the crucial thing is the love of justice. Yes. That's what you should be yeah. doing. And, and does he say in the, in the fall of the devil, the devil's problem was to regard God as a good for himself and not as a good Being like God. Yeah. Right. Okay, but, but he loved God with love of concupiscence, not love of justice. Is that right? Well, he talks about the will to happiness. He, Anselm d doesn't use the, the language of concupiscence. Well, he doesn't want okay. um, right. okay. as far as I can tell. And um, the devil screwed up by, by loving, by, by, by wanting, by desiring the best good you could possibly have, which is to be like God. And but for himself? Well, it's not that, it's, that, it, that it was for himself. Anselm says he desired it inordinately, because it's not a bad thing to want that for yourself. If Anselm says, if we said that, then being Jesus Christ would be a bad thing, right? Um, so it, it's it's more a matter, and this is why I think again, it, it's, it's Anselm bears a lot more similarities to virtue ethics. The will to justice, he says, tempers the will to happiness. So it acts upon all these these inclinations and desires that we have, and it straightens them out. It gives them to you know again to invoke something Aristotelian, a at the right time for the right reason to the right degree. Anselm doesn't use that language, per se, um, and you have to dig. You have to do a lot of digging around and, and to find examples. You know, I think it's letters and in this passage or that passage. But I think you can put them together systematically to get something very much like like that picture. Okay. Well, maybe my my, my comment is not quite right. I was trying to, to to push the point that because of Anselm, you want it more like Kant. Well, I, I, I think this distinction is far more crucial for Anselm than it is in either Aristotle or Aquinas, even though it's not denied by them. But, but this is crucial for him in a way that you don't find it in, in typical virtue ethics. But, you know, I mean, there's... It's a, it's a dispute that rumbles. Yeah, yeah I mean, loving that. yourself properly, doing, understanding what ought to be for you, what, what is your legitimate goods, is, is central. Oh, Sure, the, the, the question is not that this is okay. Sure, this is okay. The yeah. point is that ethics is really about loving the good, in this case, God, for his own sake, regardless of yourself. And, and that seems to be a point that, that is unthematized. 
things that ever saw in Aquinas. Oh, yeah. And it's, well, and it's big in, in Aristotle. Aquinas, and, and, well, in Aristotle, sure. Certainly in Aristotle. And yeah. it, it's, okay, a bit dodgy in, in Aquinas. It's yeah. big in Aristotle. It's big in Scotus. Yeah. And Scotus uh, was influenced by Aristotle. Right. Yeah. So I'm trying to say that he's not, if he's a virtue ethicist, he's not in your Aristotelian mode. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, you'd have to do a lot of pushing together. Okay, we have one question. And you have a question? Oh, okay. Well, first here, then. Uh, you said that Anselm rejects the divine command theory. Yes. And then earlier you had said, and maybe I, I missed the, the, the connection or disconnect. When person, uh, a person wills what God wills and to will, yes. that person is is doing right. Or, or that's, that's rectitude of will, yes. Okay. Uh, how is that a rejection? I take the divine, divine command theory. I take the divine command theory to be going beyond just saying that um, a person's will ought to be aligned with the will of God. Uh, I mean, natural law theory says that as well. Divine command theory, and again, this is kind of a loosey-goosey term, isn't it? You know, it means different things to different people. Uh, it tends to get invoked as the notion that um, God is the sole source of, of moral um, commands, those sorts of things. And so long as you follow those rules, you're, you're okay. And if God were to change those rules tomorrow, that would be okay too, because it's God. And Anselm considers issues like that in the Cur Deus Homo, the Prologion, um, Monologion to, to a certain extent, and in one other work. And he says, um, well, that wouldn't be God then. If God were to actually like, sort of change the rules of the game, what counts as, as right and wrong, that wouldn't be God, that would be something else. God is, is, is um, following his own, his own nature by doing that. Oh, in, in the De, De Libertate, could God take away justice from a person? Anselm says, nope, uh, once a person has justice in the world, not even God can take it away. Because why? Is that a restriction on God? No, because God wouldn't do that sort of thing. God would never command something that went against the goodness that God already knows. The divine command theory that we it's in sort of an academic category, as it often gets taught, it, it, it sounds as if, well, God can switch things up if he likes. And I, so that's what I'm saying Anselm is rejecting, and that's why he's not a good fit for that. Um, one of the, I mean, you, you've been contrasting Anselm yeah. with, the, with the other people and basically saying he's not like this in those respects. Yes. So we haven't had an awful lot of a positive account. Um, I did anticipate that you were heading toward virtue theory actually fairly early. Yeah. But um, it seems to me that there is one question that's, that's sort of outstanding here. Um, he also, Anselm seems to be, I, I would guess, a Neoplatonist in that he... In know, a very funny way. Yeah. yeah, well, he's definitely identifying God as sort of the source or defining basis of justice particularly, and maybe secondarily, other goods, too. God is, he is a Neoplatonist in, in that every one of the divine attributes is um, something within which other things participate. So God is the goodness by which other things are, are good, but not yeah, necessarily okay. you know, primarily. God is the truth by which all other truths are truthful. And we can go down the whole list. God is the, the life through which all things live. Okay, that's that's what I suspected. Um, yeah. Well, you know, again, you can pick a, a thousand different <laughs> virtue theories. Maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but um, one one notorious problem for virtue theory is it tends to provide no account for why virtues, specific virtues, are good. It just stops there, oftentimes, and yeah. says, or or it actually defeats itself by appealing to something and becomes, in a sense, something other than virtue theory. So yeah. if, if virtue really promotes happiness, then in an ultimate sense, we have a kind of um, hedonism or, or utilitarian. Or, or, or eudaimonism, yeah. more broadly. Yeah, well, right. And right. Catherine Rogers actually thinks that Anselm is a, uh, a eudaimonistic theory. I, I don't actually buy her. Well, so, so my question is simply this, I guess. If, if he's primarily a virtue theorist, 
then he is adding another component here, and that is a basis for virtue in God. And then there's, and so that, I mean, and I agree that I don't think it's divine command theory, certainly in the standard way, but there is still a basis of all virtue in God's nature. Um, so, is God ultimately the basis or defining explanation of all virtue? Or are we going to take virtue theory more like virtue is imitating God? That Oh, well, both for Anselm. I mean, okay. he, act, I mean, he says this in the Courteous Home, Christ actually gives us an example, say, for humility. Right. But then he unpacks it um, in a couple different places, in Dicta and in the Data Minus Moribus, uh, and also in a lot of the letters, what humility consists in. He's got some analyses we can put together. And he's not just referring to, to, to God in that. Um, like, like I said in here, I think all the virtues for Ansel can be conceived of as determinate ways in which the will to justice takes shape, takes, you know, takes hold of the human will, takes a stable form within it. So they're all, they're all ultimately ways of willing justice, the right relationship to, to, to God, for its own sake, within oneself, um, possibly just super, you know, superimposing it on, on the will to happiness, possibly contradicting our will to happiness when we curb our, our desires or things like that. I don't know that that, that turns them into no longer being virtues. Or no, I'm really wondering that. which kind of virtue they're... And, and I'm can also, I actually sort of yeah, yeah. Yeah. one more question okay. quickly? Oh, yeah, right, 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 right. So yeah. we can well, this is actually very uh, close or related to what you were talking about. It seems to me that, if I understood you correctly, that uh, for Anselm, uh, justice plays a central or the central role in his ethics. You say that, yeah. uh, right? And you say, well, what I'd like so what I'd like to do is to try to get some a clear grasp of what justice is for Anselm, uh, uh, especially if uh, you want to make him a non-virtue uh, a, a person who's a, who's a uh, ascribes to virtue ethics but uh, does it in a way uh, by underpinning these virtues with justice, which would uh, make him no longer a, a virtue ethicist, but at least then you would have a basis for the other virtues. Here's my question. Yeah. You say, you say, well, first of all, justice is central, yeah. and and God is justice, and everything and yeah. everything else that is just is just by virtue of participating not, in this yeah, justice, but not God. necessarily directly. It's not as if there's, there's just God and everything directly participates in God. I don't care about what, yeah. how the okay. directly or indirectly. God is supposed to be justice, right? Yeah. I want to get a grip on what justice is because I don't know what God is. So that doesn't help me to say that God well, is Well, I mean, justice. one of the implications of Anselm's doctrine is we don't, in fact, know what justice in its fullest sense is any more than we know what reason in its fullest sense is because it is God. But we, we have sort of intimation of, of it, but ours are always, uh, they can always get better and better, we, you know. But does that, doesn't that, doesn't, isn't that a very uh, destructive conclusion to come to for Anselm? In destructive that, in, in because, what way? Because, well, we can't know what justice is. There's a difference and between, there's a difference between, the other virtues, then we can't know what virtue There's a difference between not knowing, period, and not fully knowing. Well, can you give me some sense of what justice is for Anselm? Sure. Um, again, you know, what's his definition of it? Willing rectitude of will kept for its, its own sake. So being thrown into a determinate situation in which you have to stick to what what you ought to do as opposed to, say, oh, your inclination. Wait a minute. What you ought to do is supposed to be defined by what justice right. is, and I don't know what that yeah, is. Yeah, he's, he's, 
he's not providing anything like a foundational, okay, here's the three axioms of it, and then it goes from No, I just want to understand. So yeah. he has got to, he can't, he can't fling around terms loosely without defining them in some sense. He does, some actually. <laughs> well, then that's a real problem in my mind. Yeah. So, uh, um, because you, uh, Can't get a grip on, on what justice is, and then if rectitude of will will How that would be learn? what okay. always being always being steadfastly willing what is just. But again, I don't know what that is. So yeah, but how do you learn what a, what a virtue is anyway? It's not somebody coming up to you and saying, "Okay, here's the definition. Now just do this." Mm -hmm. Through practice, through a, and, and you know being em embedded in some sort of milieu, right? right. Um, so. If you want examples of all the different things, if you want examples of where Anselm gives instances, he says, here's the just thing, here's the unjust thing, here's why it's just, here's why it's unjust. There's a lot of individual examples in letters and, and you know, little bits here and there in, in uh, the, um, the treatises and, and, and uh, even arguably in, in his prayers. Um, but yeah, this is one of the challenges of he doesn't, he never, if he in fact did, as, as the Admiral said, you know, uncover the very roots and sources of the virtues and vices, he didn't write it down, unfortunately, <laughs> like a treatise. Well, but if you've got these examples of justice, I don't know if you have time. And sure. What, what, at least roughly, what would it be? I mean, that would be an inductive approach then to. Okay. Because uh, you want, you want this well rate, I think. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah well, it's really pushing this point. Yes. Yeah. Give us something better. Yeah, and it would actually, it might actually presuppose what you're trying to prove here, but as you can say, that's justice, that's justice, that's justice, all right. Well, maybe not. Maybe you can just say, well, this is a certain kind of action that's similar to that kind of action, similar to this kind of action, and what they have in common is this thing, and I'm going to call that justice. That's fair enough. Yeah. You're fine with that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have more to think about, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Well, let's uh, thank our speaker very much.